In the name of the one holy and undivided Trinity, amen. Please have a seat. We belong to a kind of Christian church that says that the bread and the wine we consume in Holy Communion are really Jesus. We say that we believe in the real presence. But when does it happen? Is Jesus sitting on the table in the back of the church? waiting for us. The uh, pita bread that we use lives in the um, library kitchen freezer most of the week. Every Sunday, we worship in a way that points to the mystery of Holy Communion, that focuses our attention on this table and the meat the, um, the, the, the meal we eat, we're not going to get too literal about the body there, at that table, everything we do in worship up to that point is preparing us for the moment of consuming God, of taking God into our mouths and our stomachs and our cells so that God becomes part of our very being. But when does it happen? Is there, a, is there a zap at any point? Not quite. You'll notice a little later, uh, after announcements, after we move into the service of Holy Communion, there are two moments where my hands make gestures or actions in relationship to the bread and the wine, where my hands touch them in uh, particular ways. And one is at what we call the institution. And that's when we repeat Jesus's words, the words of the early church, recalling Jesus's sitting at a dinner with his friends before his death and offering them bread and wine to remember him. You'll notice that I lift the bread and the wine at those moments. And this is when the Western church, the Latin church, which today is the Roman Catholic tradition, claims that the bread and the wine become Jesus. There's another moment, which because we need multi-syllabic words for everything, which we call the epiclesis, in which I invoke the Holy Spirit and move my hands in a cupped shape over the bread and the wine, touching them. And this is when the Eastern Church, today the Orthodox traditions, claim the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus. So when do we say it happens? Our tradition does a very interesting thing. The answer is both, sort of, and neither. The critical moment, as we understand it, is not in what the priest does. It is not magic hands. It is not exalted focus on the person wearing the fanciest outfit. It is what happens at the very end. It is the only all caps moment in the service. And it's all caps in the Book of Common Prayer also. Do you know what it is? The Amen. The great Amen. It's an amen so important that it has its own title. So I'll read you the official description of this moment, the great amen. 
It is the response of assent by the congregation at the conclusion of the Eucharistic prayer. As the Eucharistic celebration is shared by the congregation and the presider, the great amen emphasizes the assent of the people to the words spoken on their behalf by the presider. The great amen is the people's prayer that concludes the Eucharistic prayer. The great amen is printed in all capital letters in the Book of Common Prayer to emphasize the importance of this moment in the liturgy. Historically, the moment of consecration at the Eucharist was considered to be the institution narrative in the Western Church. Some Eastern churches understood the epiclesis to be the moment of consecration. However, the Eucharistic prayer including the institution narrative and epiclesis, is now understood to be a single text with the consecration completed as the Eucharistic prayer concludes with the people's great amen. You do it. The bread and the wine do not fully become the real presence of Christ unless you, the body of Christ, says amen at the end of that prayer. I pray it in a single voice on your behalf, in part because it's just less noisy that way. But it does not work. It does not take until you together say that amen. It is the single most important thing the congregation does in the course of this service. Everything hinges on it. God's consent to be present in physical form is contingent on it. That's an enormous amount of power. And it's appropriate because amen really means yes, or so be it, or truly, truly it is. You do have that option, by the way, when you uh, come up to receive Holy Communion at the rail. I did have one woman in a previous parish who I'd say, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, and she would say, yup. <laughs> that is an accurate translation. So uh, you are welcome to do that and make your priest giggle a little. And it is the same big, overwhelming yes that we hear from Jonah and we hear in the fishermen today where God reaches out in invitation and our whole being comes back and says, yes. And I'm telling you about this moment in the liturgy today because I think it's important in relationship to what we're about to do in our annual meeting. It points to our fundamental relationship as priest and congregation. Well, I may get to wear the fancy clothes and I may coach and teach and guide and nudge and comfort and occasionally yap at your heels a little bit. It is you who is responsible for the running of the kingdom of heaven on this corner of Brooklyn and 47th. You recultivate and sow the Garden of Eden here on this corner. I love that you've invited me to join you for a while, maybe give you some fertilizing pointers, that's great. But the power is fundamentally yours, and the work gets done according to your heart and your vision and your desire. According to our theology of the Eucharist, it is truly the people's power. So that is our question for today as we uh, leave this service fed by God and we enter annual meeting recounting God's work in our lives, our communal life in the past year and what we want to be, how we want to be in 2018. What 
is our yes.